Hi. I love days like today. I, I really do. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, there is just something really, really special when we gather together, when we share with one another. And uh, in just a little bit, we're going to celebrate uh, Holy Communion and, uh, and certainly looking forward to that. But what a blessing it is to be able to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ and lift high the name of Jesus. I mean, every week, every time we gather, every Sunday that we gather for worship, we gather together in Jesus' name. And it's in Jesus' name that we, we proclaim that Jesus is greater than anything else that this life has to offer. And, and yet, at the same time, it's not just vertical. It's not just between us and God. It is between us and each other. It is horizontal as well. The good news of the gospel isn't just for you or just for me. It is for us. Um, and so it should permeate all of our relationships. Um, we have community under this banner of grace, this banner of grace. We remind each other when we gather, when we have fellowship, true fellowship, when we, when we have that, we remind each other that uh, I, that we are far more sinful than we thought. And at the same time, we are far more loved than we ever imagined. And, uh, and so uh, we, we confess our sin to one another, but we also pray for one another that uh, we might uh, lift one another up. And so today, today we're talking about gospel community, gospel community. Um, and if you have your Bible with you today, I hope that you do, uh, please turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, so you're going to find that near the back of your Bible. But we're going to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, So who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child and had him stand among them. Truly, I tell you, he said, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one child like this in my name welcomes me. Amen. You may have heard the story of a very stern-faced preacher uh, who was just letting his church have it one Sunday morning. He was preaching on the subject of the tears of Jesus. And uh, he apparently made this statement. He said, three times we read that Jesus wept, but we never read that Jesus smiled. And so from the pew just below the pulpit, a little girl, forgetting where she was, uh, she suddenly cries out, oh, but I know he did. And the serious looking preacher, he looks shocked. How dare she cry out in worship? And so he glared down from the pulpit at the little girl. And he says, why do you say that, my child? And the little girl, she knew that Everyone was looking at her. She was suddenly aware that she was the center, and she was understandably frightened, but she spoke with a humble sincerity that, that she could, and so she said, because the Bible says he called a little child, and he came to him. And if Jesus had looked like you, I know the child would have been afraid to come to you. The, the disciples, the disciples have been arguing at this point. I mean, our, our passage picks up at that time, at that time. <laughs> they, they have been doing some stuff, right? They've been, they've been going around. They had just experienced the transfiguration. They, they'd seen power uh, of, of healing and all this. And, and it says at that time, at that time, the disciples, they came and they got a big question for Jesus. They got a big question. We got to know. 
We got to know. Who's the greatest? Huh? We were talking about it. I, I don't know. We can't decide. I'm pretty great. He's pretty great. Who's the greatest? I mean, you got to think about the audacity to ask the question, right? I mean, it's really the equivalent of this. Okay, here's, what, here's the equivalent, right? So who, Jesus, who is the best in the church? Who's the best in the church? Who at New Bethel has it all together? We're trying to decide. I don't know. I mean, which one of us gives the most and takes the least? Who's the greatest in our little colony of heaven? Jesus responds to the disciples by having a child come and stand in front of them. And he says, truly I tell you, unless you turn and become like this, become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Some tough words. Jesus, the one who came to make it possible for one to enter heaven, says, you're never going to enter heaven if you don't do that. So what is that? What is that? What is it about a child that Jesus wants us to become? I mean, surely he doesn't mean that we're to act like children. I mean, I think Scripture speaks about maturity and wisdom uh, that's not often attributed to a child. So what could Jesus possibly mean? Well, first, I think he's speaking about the humility of a child. I mean, just directly, right, this passage, the context here, they're talking about who is the greatest, right? And so he responds with the, the child, right? He says, this is what he wants the disciples to turn to. I mean, notice that word that Jesus uses there. He says, turn, turn, and become like that. He wants them to turn from this need to be the greatest, this need to know who's the greatest, this need to be first and foremost in the pack. A child usually, I mean, think about it, a child doesn't usually push themselves to the front. Uh, they, they don't usually uh, push him or herself forward. No, usually children, they, they sort of fade into the background. And maybe that's on us a little bit that we, we like to ignore children. But, uh, you know, usually uh, they don't wish for that kind of prominent role. Uh, they would rather be left in sort of obscurity. They don't know any better. They don't know that they're supposed to desire to be great. <laughs> They don't know that they're supposed to desire to, I mean, the world kind of teaches, I mean, child, children have no concern for social status. They don't even know what that is. It's only as they grow up in this world, it's only as they become initiated into the competition that this world has to offer, these disciples, they are so well acquainted with the uh, fierce struggle and the scramble for prizes and first places, their humility is long gone. They want to know who is the best. Who does Jesus love the most? Because obviously Jesus would love the best the most, obviously. Obviously. So where do I stand in comparison to everybody else? Where do I stand, Jesus? The great preacher Charles Spurgeon, he pointed out that the children do not try to be humble, but they are so. And the same is the case, he says, with really gracious people, right? The imitation of humility is sickening. We hate that. But the reality is attractive. And so Jesus, he is calling all those who are under him, right, to follow him in humility under his greatness. Under his greatness, right? That uh, he doesn't want us to portray some false sense of humility. He wants us to be the real deal. 
the real deal, right? To not take ourselves so seriously, to not seek the status that we feel like we deserve, the, the privilege that we need, the power that we desire, and just simply rest in knowing that God has us right where he wants us. He wants us to know that we are important to God and for that to be enough. The next thing I think that we also see here, right, is that uh, part of being a child is that Jesus wants us to embody dependence. Dependence. To, to the child, a state of dependence is perfectly natural. Perfectly natural. A child never thinks that he or she can face life on their own. They are perfectly content to be dependent on those who love them, those who care for them. Children are needy. They're needy. I mean, children, especially in Jewish society, were to be looked after, not looked up to. And yet Jesus, he calls the child, he says, stand in front, look at this. This is what you are supposed to be. I mean, that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that we must not only be, be comfortable with the fact that we're needy, but actually embrace that fact. Embrace it. The kingdom of heaven is not for self-righteous people. It's not for people who don't need things. The kingdom of heaven is for the needy. I know this flies in the face of everything that we have learned in the world. We've been taught both directly and indirectly that as adults we need to be self-sufficient. We need to be able to provide for ourselves. We need to be strong and capable. Um, but we honestly have it all backwards. What we call strength, God looks upon many times as obstinate weakness. And Jesus is saying, let me care for you like a little child. Let me care for you. Let me call the shots. Let me love you. Let me provide for you. Depend on me and I will give you all the strength you need. I'll give you all the peace that you desire. We need to ask ourselves, how, how would our lives look differently if we lived every day dependent upon God? Martin Lloyd-Jones, he once said, I sometimes think that the very essence of the whole Christian position and the secret of a successful spiritual life is just to realize two things. Two things. I must have complete, absolute confidence in God and no confidence in myself. So there is humility, there is dependence, and then there's also trust. Children are instinctively dependent, and just as instinctively, uh, they trust their parents to meet their needs. Think back to your younger days. When we were children, we didn't buy our own food. We didn't buy our own clothes, but we never doubted that we would be clothed and fed. We didn't maintain our home, we, but we didn't doubt that there was a place of shelter, a place of warmth, a place of comfort for us. I mean, children, they, they don't just trust their parents. <laughs> children don't just trust their parents. They trust everybody. They trust every. I mean, they trust what the teacher says. They trust what little Susie told them on the playground. They, they trust what the random guy says on the sidewalk. That's why we tell children not to talk to strangers. They're, they trust everybody. Children give trust before it's earned. And Jesus is calling us to trust like that. To trust like that. To take that giant leap and jump with both feet and trust the Lord. I mean, it's only by trusting God that we learn that he is trustworthy. Heaven is going to be filled with people who trust. 
They trust God, but not only that, they trust each other. The children of God, they trust each other. The family of God, as an outpost of heaven, our community should be marked by these things. Humility, dependence, trust. We're to love and support others in their weakness, but the other side of that same coin is that we are to love and trust others that God has placed around us. That's what gospel community is about. Our number one commonality in this place is that we are children of God. However, we also share the same struggles that the disciples had. We're children of God and among children of God, but our judgment often tells us to not trust each other too much. Don't trust each other too much. Don't depend too much on others. Don't reveal too much. Don't say too much. Don't show too much weakness. We've been hurt before, and so we put up these walls. Everybody here has been hurt before in some form or fashion. We put up walls to protect ourselves. And so Satan likes to tell us that we should keep God's people at a distance. Keep them at arm's length. That way they can't hurt us. I mean, if you can't get us to believe that God is not to be trusted, then certainly it's the people of God that we are not to trust. He will focus his efforts on getting us to not trust one another and thus keep us disconnected from the life-giving community that we so desperately desire. Satan reminds us, even when we get together, he reminds us of every time our trust has been violated by people. especially people in the church. He reminds us that, that we once trusted and we have been burned by the family of God. Let me just say, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. I'm sorry that that happened. I'm sorry for the pain that you went through. I too have experienced betrayal at the hands of friends. I have experienced that kind of pain. Church hurts the worst kind of hurt. I have felt the anger that wells up when you realize that you're the subject of gossip, the topic of slander among the saved. I wouldn't wish it upon anyone. But if you have experienced that, then hear me say that I am so sorry. We're to weep with those who weep. We need to recognize that there are no perfect churches. There's no perfect churches out there because there are no perfect, perfect Christians out there. We can recognize that our community amongst each other is imperfect and simultaneously recognize that Jesus wants us to let our guard down. Let me say that again. We need to recognize that our community amongst each other is imperfect and simultaneously Jesus wants us to let our guard down. Jesus wants to tear down our walls that we put up to protect ourselves so that the gospel might infiltrate our lives. Jesus is saying to each of us, come to me like a little child. Trust that I'm not going to hurt you. Show me your scars and I will show you mine. It takes a lot of courage to step out of your seat and come forward for prayer. It requires someone admitting 
weakness, someone confessing powerlessness, someone showing that they're in need. But it's not until those things happen that we can even be saved, right? We can't receive Christ without that. And we can't be the church without it either, though. Christ accepts the weak, he accepts the powerless, he accepts needy people, and his bride should too. Verse 5 here says that whoever welcomes one child like this in my name welcomes me. Jesus is saying if a person welcomes the poor, ordinary people, people who have no influence, no wealth, no power, the people who need things done for them, He's welcoming me. He's welcoming God. What does this look like? What's it look like, practically speaking? We see this in Acts chapter 2. Beginning in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, The believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day, They devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. I read this, and I get really excited about that. This was the early church putting the gospel on display. More specifically, though, this uh, is what happened when the children of God receive one another in Jesus' name. Coming like a child leads to this. And so today, we're going to strive to be the gospel community that God intended us to be. We're going to share the Lord's Supper here in just a little bit, but right now, we're going to have a time of sharing with one another. We're going to have a time to share our our joys and our concerns, a time of testimony. What is the Lord doing in your life? How can we pray for you? Don't get me wrong. We have a prayer list. We pray for people all the time. This is about you. This is about us. How can we as the body be the body to its members? I have a microphone here. You just raise your hand. I will come to you and allow you to share whatever the Lord puts on your heart. But we're, gonna, we're just going to have a time here of sharing and a time of, of prayer. We'll pray for each one as it comes. Brother Jerry. Heavenly Father, we come to you as a church, as your church. But Heavenly Father, I come to you as an individual. I come to you thanking you for all the things that you've blessed me with all my life. I have taken them for granted. Forgive me for that. But Heavenly Father, as I got older, I got wiser, and you gave me situations where I could be a part of other people's lives, that I could be there to witness to them, that I could be there to help. I could be there to share whatever I have with others. Heavenly Father, you have blessed me in my older years through so many situations. I have a family you've blessed me with, Heavenly Father, and I have a church that you've blessed me with. I just thank you for the situations that you've been allowed me to get through, that you've been there with me. And I thank you for all of those in New Bethel, Heavenly Father, those that have been faithful and those that have turned away for whatever reason. But Heavenly Father, I know that you're still in charge. I still know that whatever you want, whatever you desire is what's going to happen. You either allow it or cause it to happen as a result of that. 
I just want to continue to serve you at whatever days I have left on this earth. Heavenly Father, as we get older and our family gets older, as those babies grow up to be adults, we just pray that you would give us the want-tos and desires to be more like you, and that the Holy Spirit could do what it does to draw us all closer to you. What a joy you've been in my life. What a joy you've been in my family's life. And how you've blessed me ever since the day that I got married way a long time ago. Heavenly Father, all I know is I never had a doubt as to what it is I needed to do because the Holy Spirit guided me, and I didn't know that. But I do know it now, Heavenly Father. As a result of that, I thank you for all that you bless me with. You bless our families, all our families, Heavenly Father, those that are faithful, those that are committed. And your word tells us that if we would just look to you, turn our lives over to you, and let you be the Lord of our life, as a result of that, each and every day, you would give us what it is we need to do to serve you and to be more like you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for again for this church. I thank you for and pray for our pastor and his family. I pray for all the families here. And I pray when we leave this place today, we know we've been in your presence. And as a result of that, Heavenly Father, we can be more committed to you. And we know we need to look forward to what it is you have for us in our lives. So help us to be more like you. Have the Holy Spirit work on us, be the best we can be, because the Holy Spirit is here. And we thank you for that, Heavenly Father. And we thank you for all that you bless and give us. In Jesus' holy, precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jerry. All right. Who else would like to share? Dear God, I just wanted to thank you for this church and for the people that worship you online, too. And dear God, I just thank you for the car that you gave to me. That I can pick up the little guy that lives next door to us that has cancer. I see him when he's walking with his groceries. And I pick him up to bring him to his home. And I thank you for that. Because I know that the car that you gave to me, you would want me to use it for your kingdom and not for my pleasure, but for your pleasure. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. And just so you guys know, you don't have to you don't have to offer a prayer or whatever. You can you, praying is great, but you don't have to offer. You can just share a story, testimony of what God is doing in your life right now. Right. I had a situation come up this this Friday with the Roe versus Wade and all these things you have we have going on and after I got done I, st I started thinking about you know I need to know the word better I need to know how to respond to some of these things that people you know people are saying that because I believe God's word is absolute I believe it's true and I want to be able to share it with people in a loving manner not a manner that is <laughs> As my wife says, I have a tendency to be overbearing. <laughs> I can be very opinionated. Um, and I just pray in my own life that God continues to work on me on that part of being humbled, being, you know, honest and true with my words that I know because the outcome is not the battle. The outcome is eventually that person comes to know Christ because that's all that's going to matter in the end mm -hmm. is because, remember, Jesus is coming back. And... There are going to be no excuses. They're going to have to do that. And I just, I just need people to continue to pray because as I meet all these people, I just want Jesus to shine in my life so that they know what I stand for and who I am. Yeah, yeah and, and, and so we're, we're obviously very thankful uh, for, um, you know, certainly that, that you know, what, what occurred this week with, uh, you know, the situation Roe v. Wade. You know, we are so thankful for that giant step in that direction. Um, obviously, there is much 
work to be done. And so let's continue to pray uh, for that. Let's, let's pray for that right now, actually. Uh, God, we, we thank you uh, that you, your sovereign hand is moving uh, in our in our nation, Lord, we recognize that each and every life, whether it be child, mother, grandmother, a, a, a heart beating of any age, Lord, we recognize is made in your image and bestowed with dignity and honor and value. For God, you knit each of us together in our mother's womb. And so, God, we give you thanks that uh, a little bit of light entered the world this week. Lord, we pray for much, much more light. Lord, may, may we as the church, we as Christians continue to live out our faith in those ways. That rather than... Uh, people knowing um, that we are Christians by, by what we say and how we preach it and how we uh, tell them, may we show them with our love, show them with our actions, show them with our service, show them with our humble hearts. God, we, we pray that, uh, that state by state, case by case, Lord, that, that people would turn to you that they would seek your best in mind. But God, we thank you. We rejoice. We rejoice over the, uh, the possibility of lives being saved here in this nation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, who's next? We've got a little bit of time left. Oh, do you want to say something? Yeah, okay. Great. Yeah, yes, I just want to say that I talk to a lot of people all over the United States, my job, and, um, you know, I hear a lot of situations, a lot of things that um, I know if they knew the Lord, it would be so totally different. And so just, you know, keep me in your prayers so that I stand out and that I don't, I'm not afraid to speak out about Jesus. And um, I've had opportunities I have done, and I've had opportunities I didn't say a word, and I should have. And, you know, that's just a human in me, mm -hmm. but, you know, I just want to stay positive, and I just want to let people know that, you know, there's a, there is, there's a, good, there's a good thing, and, and God is good, and um, that, uh, you know, if you don't have anything in your life, you hit the bottom, mm -hmm. the only way up, they look up to God. Yeah. I think, I think we've all probably had moments where we have uh, certainly uh, spoke, uh, when we probably should not have spoken. <laughs> um, and there are times where we uh, certainly did not speak when we should have spoken up. Um, and so praying for um, the Holy Spirit to direct our conversations, certainly that our conversations may be seasoned with salt, as it says uh, in Scripture. Um, anybody else? Okay. Awesome. Not a great speaker. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, you're good. Um, I, I've had a lot of pressure on me the last couple of years. My mother, my brother, and my 98-year-old father. And, um, and then, of course, my husband. He's not well. But... Um, a lot of you have been praying for me, and I got to tell you, the power of prayer is, is just beyond belief. It's wonderful. It has taken so much of the anxieties, the burdens off of me. I just want to tell you all, thank you so much. You are my family. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vivian. And we will continue to, to pray for you, and, and certainly uh, I know that uh, it has been, uh, it's been a difficult season of life that you are in, and, and so we continue to lift you up, our sister uh, there. Anybody else? Everybody is frozen. If I move too much, he will see me. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, why don't we go ahead and, and, and pray, and, and, and we'll, we'll invite the deacons forward uh, to... Uh, 
you know, as we begin to uh, serve communion. But uh, let's go ahead and, and go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for, for how you are moving in this body. We give you thanks for how you are, uh, how you are providing. And so, Lord, we look forward to greater, uh, we look forward to greater testimony of life, of love. We look forward to the things that you will do. Lord, we seek you to grow us. We seek you to uh, guide us. Lord, we look forward to you adding to our number. But Lord, most of all, we, we seek to be the humble children that you want us to be, dependent upon you and trusting in you every day. We continue to lift up those who are on our prayer list. We continue to pray for those who are in need. Lord, help us to have renewed vision for where we can uh, extend a hand, where we can love others in your name. May we welcome you as we welcome others. We thank you, God, for all of these joys, whether spoken or unspoken, and all of these concerns. May you, may you continue to do what only you can do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.